operations at peak performance. I'm Bill Blunden, Corel Sense's Chief Marketing Officer, and I'm joined today also by Yaron Caspi, uh, our Director of Solutions Engineering. I'll give a short presentation on uh, the approach that we use to tuning and tracking performance on Trizetto applications. That's not just for facets, but also for QNXT and Care Advance. Uh, and then at, at the end, after we talk about that, Yaron will give a, uh, a demonstration of how we use our software and actually how Trizetto uses our software to manage the performance of all of these applications. Uh, our agenda for today is, first of all, how to monitor Trizetto software across the complete technology stack how to gather better user information from your desktops and Citrix environment, how to troubleshoot both frequent and intermittent performance problems, how to manage changes without risking performance degradation. So first, a word about who we are. CorelSense is the leading enterprise APM company. Our focus is on ensuring that all business critical software applications execute efficiently. We monitor the real user experience, not just of applications that run in browsers, but also on rich clients and desktops and mobile devices. We monitor new, legacy, and packaged applications. And we support the broadest range of technologies in the marketplace. And that certainly includes facets, QNXT, and Care Advance from Trizetto. Trizetto is actually a customer of ours. They use us, our software internally. And if anyone in the audience is using the hosted versions of this software, um, you will soon be using, uh, in the background, uh, our performance management software as well. So that's why we're here and who we are. I think the question is, why are you here? And that's probably because Trizetto is a very sophisticated set of applications. That's true of facets, which we'll focus on today primarily, and also the other ones as well. Uh, it's a very extensive technology stack heavy focus on Windows, Linux and Unix on uh, the database side. Um, but I think uniquely, in, or, or increasingly uniquely, in the healthcare marketplace, um, Citrix is used and rich clients are used to deliver applications uh, to inside your company and outside as well. FACETS uses something called the Extended Integration, or FXI, which is a suite of uh, web services that allows FACETS uh, to inter integrate and interface with other applications you may have in your enterprise. It uses a fair amount of middleware, WebSphere, BizTalk, MQ series. So again, very sophisticated applications, lots of different technologies uh, as part of facets, but also uh, inside your corp connecting to inside your corporation as well. Uh, the hosted version of facets that we're involved with involves thousands of servers, a small customer in production on the host of platform may generate tens of millions of transactions. A large payer who has deployed the software on site may have more than 4,000 people accessing the application simultaneously. So performance is a big issue just in terms of those numbers, but it's also important in terms of all the processes that are uh, involved in FACETS. FACETS does an awful lot of things. It allows you to do member enrollment, uh, populate data that allows you to print out subscriber cards, uh, tracks eligibility for uh, your subscribers, does claims processing, check processing, billing, and uh, receipts for billing as well. So those are just a few of the functions that FACETS provides. H having those all available to all users when necessary is important. Making sure that they all run at peak performance is even more important. One of the things that we've learned over the last several years working with uh, Trizetto and with uh, these applications is that performance is more than just one thing. It's not finding a specific uh, broken issue or a specific network segment, which is slow. It's a five-step process. You need to measure the real user experience of people inside your company and also your, at your subscriber companies as well. You need to be able to track every hop of every transaction because you never quite know where a performance problem may be. You need to isolate um, the problem all the way down to a line of code or a SQL statement and really understand what's, what's causing the problem at the root cause. 
you need to serve lots of different constituencies because again it's not just IT staff involved it's multiple people within IT staff performance planners database people network experts operations people developers and also people outside of IT business people and even your customers and finally you need to report on any issue that you find and performance overall in a way which is easy to understand by all of those constituencies. So, first of all, you need to be able to track the real user experience at every endpoint. Most people who focus on performance engineering focus primarily on browser-based software. That's an important issue, but in the case of Trizetto applications, Citrix and Rich clients are also important. That's the way they deliver uh, the software to end users. It's also important to track transactions across all hops because again with all these different processes going on uh, sometimes in parallel and sometimes uh, separately lots of different people may be using parts of your technology stack at the same time while others are using other pieces. So it's important to be able to understand what each user is doing across all hops of the process that they may be using. So for example in this case John is opening a new account, maybe he's in a subscriber company, going through the web and connecting to a, a number of applications including a .NET service. Uh, Ed may be submitting a claim, maybe this is an internal employee uh, using the Citrix environment, again connected to .NET and another set of technologies. And Ken may be checking the eligibility of a specific person to see if their claim uh, matches what their policy actually uh, provides to them. And again, maybe using a different set of technologies, but again, sharing some other as well. So it's important to track all of these transactions across all of their hops because it's they're not isolated events. They're all sharing different pieces of technology at different times and in different locations. Now that's also important to try to isolate sporadic uh, or intermittent problems. So again, if uh, one, one set of users in a specific geography or at a specific time of day or just some people who are having problems together which don't have any obvious uh, connection, uh, it's important to be able to track all this information so when there is a problem that's identified intermittently or otherwise, you can make sure you track down every single piece of that transaction across all of its hops and really analyze the data at the level of detail you need to. Uh, this is a very important issue. I think most customers that we deal with have multiple constituencies, storage people, network people, virtualization, infrastructure, developers, um, operations, and business people who are involved in the system uh, at some level. And particularly the business people are very concerned not about the specific reason why something is slow or not available, but getting it fixed quickly. So many of these teams have their own performance management tools. They may have a capacity planning tool or a, a specific database monitoring tool. Those are worthwhile and very useful to the people that are solving that specific piece of the problem. But what they really need to do is have a common language, a common tool that they can share, identify a problem together, and then if they want to use their own specific tool to tune or test or fix a problem in their area, that's great. But it's important that everybody in the same room is talking about the same problem using the same data at the same time. And finally, um, again, since there are so many different kinds of people involved, it's important to report on problems or slow performance in a way that people understand, not just technical people, not just network administrators, operations people, or developers, but business people. And in some cases, uh, a subscriber company, maybe an IT group in your customers. Uh, and even, of course, the, the people that are managing the show overall. Present the information in a way which is not just large blocks of uh, columns of data, but easy to use, under, easy to comprehend and understand uh, screens that highlight the issues and allow you then to drill down to the specific detail of each problem. So that's a quick overview of what, we, uh, what we've learned in the last few years dealing with Trizetto applications. But I think 
something that would be very helpful to you is to actually take a look at the way we use our software to look at Trizetto data and try to understand how to where any performance problems are and how to increase the performance overall. So to do that, I'd like to introduce Yaron Caspi, again, our Director of Solutions Engineering, to give you a brief demo on our software. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Okay. So as Bill mentioned, we have a number of customers that use SharePath in order to monitor uh, facets. And what we've done is we've taken uh, data from one of these customers. We've obfuscated the business elements, of course. Uh, and uh, we basically are now going to show you what monitoring facets in a production environment actually looks like. So without further ado, Right, so just a word or so about uh, general navigation before we talk specifically about facets. So uh, here on the top left-hand side of our screen, we have our application selector. Uh, many of our customers uh, monitor not only facets, they monitor a number of applications. So you can basically determine which applications you're interested in focusing on. Uh, in our case, we'll just leave this on facets. Um, on the top side of the screen, we have our time frame selector, and this basically lets you uh, go back and forth uh, between different time frames uh, in order to focus on specific phenomena. On the right hand side, we have our bookmarks or favorite button, which basically lets you uh, save certain screens that you customarily would go back and forth to. And then you have our share functionality, which lets you then share the data that you're looking at with uh, perhaps a colleague, um, maybe an expert from a specific field, or you can just copy the screen URL and send it to them, or maybe uh, save a screenshot and send that. So enough about navigation. Let's look at uh, deployment of facets. This is a very typical deployment. Uh, you can see end user requests that are going through to a Citrix layer. There are eight servers in this layer. Now, regardless of whether uh, your uh, clients are thick clients or you are using a Citrix layer, it, it makes no difference uh, in terms of share path. This is just an example. From the Citrix layer, they're going through to a Microsoft SQL server and to two WebSphere servers. Now, what I could do is I could break this down and we could look at all of those Citrix servers independently. So we can see the flow between each of those Citrix servers and the endpoints. And you can see that between each channel you have information such as average response time as well as uh, average number of calls per minute. In addition, on the left and the right hand side of the screen, if you have uh, more applications, you have our KPIs or key performance indicators that give you an overall uh, view of how your application is doing. So in our case, we're looking at facets, right? We have a 1.12 transactions per second. We have an average response time of just over one second, so 1.257 seconds. We have 669 transactions. And more importantly, in the middle, we have a good idea of how our uh, application is meeting or, or breaching its SLA. So 97% of the transactions are adhering to SLA. We have something like 3% that are not. Now, this is more of a logical diagram. So you can see all of the various hops between the different components within your data center. But if you're looking at things from more of an operational perspective, all you need to do is click on the given application, right? in this case, facets. And you'll go through to our SLA watch. And our SLA watch is, as I mentioned, more of an operational screen. Uh, this is where you'll see many uh, uh, ops teams, uh, perhaps uh, NOx, uh, making most use of the product. It gives you a good idea in terms of the various transaction types that you have. So we have hospital claims processing, uh, we have agreement medical, class plan definition, and so on and so forth. We can see which application they belong to. In this case, they're all from facets. What their average response time is what the 95th percentile is, standard deviation, 
how many transactions for each of these types have been invoked. So right, I have like 221 transactions of the hospital claims processing. How they're adhering to SLA in percentage. How many are exceeding the SLA in numbers. What the average transactions per minute is. And how many are failing uh, in terms of both uh, numbers and percentage. When we uh, to uh, a failed transaction, what we really mean is that there was an error return code for that uh, transaction. Right? One of the things that we noticed um, uh, very soon when, when looking at applications within the enterprise space is that you have two different metrics that really impact how your end users are experiencing um, the behavior of the application. One of them is uh, response time. So we have uh, a SLA that is set based upon response time and then based upon how the transactions are failing because you could have very quickly responding uh, failed transactions with error codes such as 500 or 401. Uh, they'll come back very, very quickly. So in terms of SLA, they, they're adhering to a response time, but nonetheless they've failed. And we give you the option and the ability to alert on either of these or both. Then on the left-hand side of the screen, you have our target or donut view, which is a graphical representation of the percentage of SLA column. It's basically showing you those transaction types in the form of bubbles and where they reside. Are they in the green? Are they in the yellow, right, like the hospital claims? Or are they in the red? Now, in the case that we have in front of us, we really have two transaction types that are very interesting. One of them is the hospital claims processing, right? Because basically, if you look at their 95th percentile here, 5% of your users have response times that are over 20 seconds, which is very, very high. And it's something you definitely want to look at. Um, in a production environment, you would uh, probably have an alert, uh, and you'd be notified of that alert, and that would lead you to the screen. Uh, but this is just an example. Uh, the other transaction type that we're interested in looking in uh, is the medical claims processing because, as you can see, uh, we're basically uh, failing 20% of the time. We have 25 transactions that have failed. So without any real uh, uh, importance, let's, let's start looking at both of these. Uh, we'll look first at the hospital claims processing. Let's just list the slowest transaction instances that we have here. And what you'll see is that each and every one of the transactions within the system gets stored within SharePath. This is not sampling. This is not averaging. This is basically ca intercepting, capturing, and storing each and every one of these transactions. So we can pick a transaction from Elizabeth that took over three, 34 and a half seconds, right? And we can start off by looking at the topology for that specific transaction. So basically, again, we have our start time, we have our end time. We can see who it came from. Basically, it came from Elizabeth T. We can see which Citrix server it hit, right? So this is uh, CTX facets ORND4. And we can see that it then hit a WebSphere server. We can see that the slowest element here, right, has to do with the call between the Citrix server and the WebSphere server. Right. If I click on the tree, View, then I'll have the same information, but now I can actually see the different specific events that were involved in this transaction. So if I click on the originating request, you can see where it came from, right? Here we have the actual process that Elizabeth was using in order to invoke this transaction, right? Sarah exe 0471.exe. We can see that it hit this Citrix server, basically what the data center response time was. We can see what the start time was. And then we can see all the information that's within the payload, such as the username uh, and uh, the Citrix server in this case. In addition, we have the window title. So we can see that this was in the context of a hospital claims processing for Edward Healy. Now, this is of just looking at the response time for that specific transaction. We know that the majority of the response time was on the web server side of things. So we can click on the event that hit the web server, uh, sorry, the web server, 
and we can see that it went over port 9080. Protocol was HTTP. This was, by the way, an HTTP post. Uh, we can see how many bytes were sent. We can see how many bytes were received, what the time to first byte was. And again, all of the payload information, so we can see that this response was a successful one. We got a 200 return code for this. Uh, and we can see exactly which host it hit. So this was an example of looking at a slow transaction. But let's go back to the menu and look at a failed transaction. So I'm doing the same thing, more or less. I'm just clicking on the medical claims processing transaction type, and I'm looking at the fail transaction instances. And you can see, once again, all the transactions that failed. You can see which users experienced this. You can see what their response time was. You can see, by the way, in this case, the response time is pretty quick. Let's click on just any one of these. Once again, click on the topology. And we can see that, in this case, the request came from end user, went through, uh, in this case, uh, ND2, the ND2 Citrix server and from there to the SQL Server. Once again, I'm clicking on the tree diagram, and I can see the initial request that came from Jeff M. And then I can see that it hit a SQL Server. Now, notice that next to the SQL Server, I have this red dot that indicates an error or an exception. I have, within the details, the full SQL call. So you could basically take this back to um, a DBA for further investigation. You can see that my protocol in this case is TDS, so that would be MSSQL protocol, how many bytes were sent, how many bytes were received. And here I have my error code. So my error code in this case is 949, and I have the message itself. If I double click on that, we'll see that the message is that the temp DB is skipped. You cannot run a query that requires temp DB. Right. So, um, I'm going to guess that there are some uh, uh, prod support people on this call. I'll just show you a very cool scenario that would illustrate exactly how you could use this in a, a real environment. For that purpose, I'm going to change my time frame. So let's take a classic scenario where you have an um, end user that calls up and complains. As I mentioned before, SharePath captures each and every single transaction. So you can basically tie down that experience to any call that's being made from any user. And then you can search for that. And we have a wide variety of search options. But in our case, let's just search for a specific user. We're searching for transactions from Graham H. And here we have all the transactions that came through from Graham H. Right? You can see that he is the source for all these transactions. Let's sort these by response time. And as you can see, the majority of these transactions are in the 400, 500, 600 millisecond mark. We have here one that took over two seconds. Let's look at the slowest of these, the one that took two seconds. We can look once again at the topology. Right, this transaction took two seconds, 110 milliseconds. We can see it's coming from end users, going to the Citrix ND4 server, and from there to the SQL. And we can see that the slowest element within this transaction is the SQL call. So if we click on the tree view, we can have a look once again. We can see it came from Bram H. And in our case, this was the SQL that took that huge amount of time. Right? Again, CDS, how many bytes were sent? 950 bytes were sent, over 13,000 were received. Right? Something that you can easily take back to uh, like a DBA team for further investigation. Right, so, so far everything we've looked at has been more from an operational, perspe operational perspective. Um, I'm going to show you uh, an example now of how you would look at the data from more of an engineering perspective, kind of uh, looking at it from a mile-high data center uh, perspective, right? So to do that, I'm going to click on my favorites button. I'm going to go to a specific scenario that I have saved. And what you'll notice here almost immediately, right, is that out of the eight Citrix servers, I have 
two servers here, ND1 and ND3, which basically have no traffic going to them. So basically, these Citrix servers could be down. Uh, it could be maybe a misconfiguration. There could be a number of reasons for that to happen, but the end result is the same. There's no traffic flowing to them, and as a result, we can assume, and I'm going to show you how we can prove, that there's more traffic that's going to the other six boxes that are up and running. To do that, I'm going to click on our response time breakdown, and what you're looking at right now is our data center intelligence view. And this is basically a, a huge OLAP cube. We have more than 200 views in here, and you can slice and dice the data from different perspectives. Um, what I'm going to do is, I'm first of all, instead of looking at a average response time perspective, I'm going to look at a processing time perspective. I could have also looked at concurrency or invocations, but really uh, what I want to do here is I want to see the impact on those other six servers. Um, I'm going to increase my response time, just give a bit more in terms of a time frame perspective to see the change itself. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the Citrix servers and break them down by the different nodes. What you see is that up to about 11 o'clock, all of the eight servers were working fine. When those two servers went down, the ND1 and ND3, when they went down basically, I had a huge increase in terms of processing time on the remaining servers within the infrastructure. Right? So we can see these servers basically took the brunt of the effort and they're you know, experiencing a much higher processing time uh, as a result of those two servers being down. Uh, at this point, um, I'm going to actually turn uh, things over to back over to Bill, and then I guess uh, at the end we can take uh, some questions. So, uh, without further ado, great. So, um, let me just show my screen for you, and um, we'll close things off. With uh, some questions, so um, we have a. If you go down to the bottom of your, uh, uh, go to webinar presentations, see a place where you can enter a question while you're potentially doing that. Again, very conscious of your time, so we don't want to take uh, much longer than our allotted period. If we don't have time to uh, to answer your question, please uh, contact me at the email address you see on your screen or contact uh, Yaron at uh, his email address or go to our website. We'd be happy to uh, go through uh, a demos uh, in more detail for your company. Uh, 